Gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are switched uh, to silent, please? Um, we have apologies from Mills Briggs and Alec Cole Hamilton. Uh, the first item on our agenda is our final evidence session on sport for everyone. And can I welcome to the committee Aileen Campbell, Minister for Public Health and Sport, and David Grieve, Head of Active uh, Scotland Division, Scottish Government. Uh, could I invite the Minister to make an opening statement and can I apologise for being slightly delayed? No, that's, that's OK. Um, thank you, Convener. And as you noted, I'm joined by Derek Grieve, who's Head of Active Scotland Division. Um, as the committee will be aware, I'm absolutely clear about the importance of sport and physical activity. My ministerial portfolio, Public Health and Sport, signifies a deliberate, clear and connected approach that exploits the benefits of physical activity and sport to improve the health of the people of Scotland. We want to create a culture in which healthy behaviours are the norm right through people's lives. The Scottish Government's vision is of a Scotland where more people are more active more often. And sport has an important role to play in realising that vision. In Scotland, Sport Scotland are developing a world-class sporting system at all levels, connecting sport in schools and education, club and community sport and performance sport. That system has helped Scottish athletes achieve huge success at a number of levels, Commonwealth Games, Olympics, Paralympics, as well as national, European and world championships. Through their successes, Scottish athletes are inspiring others on their own sporting pathway and providing the rest of us with immense pride and motivation to get more active ourselves. Through our investment in facilities, we are providing participation opportunities for people and communities across Scotland. Since 2007, Sport Scotland has invested over £168 million in supporting local clubs, local authorities, sports governing bodies and other organisations, deliver a wide range of new and upgraded sports facilities. The recently published Scottish Household Survey showed participation in all physical activity in sport was slightly increased from 72% in 2007 to 79% in 2016. And although we'd like, all like to see higher numbers, I'm encouraged by the increase in numbers of children who now meet the CMO's physical activity guidelines, but we recognise, of course, that there is still more to do. And that's why, in order to better evidence the impact which sport has across our communities, my officials are working directly with sp Scottish sporting governing bodies to help improve their data collection and in turn help measure the impact of their outcomes against the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework. Mm -hmm. To ensure children from all backgrounds have access to sport and physical activity, uh, this government has invested 11.6 million... Sorry, I... Sorry. <laughs> 11.6 million in supporting schools meet our PE commitment of two hours or periods per week. This is up from 10% in 2004-05 to 98% in 2016. This is also backed up by significant investment in active schools. The latest figures from the Active Schools programme, published a couple of weeks ago, show that active schools participation levels have increased by 52% over the last five years, with 6.8 million visits recorded during the academic year 2016-17. And our ambition to create a more active Scotland was why, in our manifesto, we gave commitment to making Scotland the first daily mile nation. Getting the nation active requires action right across government, and that is why we have put in place record investment in walking and cycling, and will continue to do so for the rest of this Parliament. And this will be doubled to £80 million in 2018-19. Active travel will improve health outcomes for individuals, improving both mental and physical health. These initiatives are aimed to assist people from across Scotland become more physically active as well as integrate with their local community. Now, I know that uh, a big part of the committee's focus has been on accessibility of the school estate. And we know that there are thousands of sports facilities in the overall school estate, including sports halls, pitches, multi-use outdoor areas, swimming pools, running tracks and tennis courts available for community use. But we also know more can be done to maximise the use of this resource and this investment. And as I mentioned in my response to your phase one report, I would be find it really uh, useful and in, uh, informative if the committee could share any evidence it has collected on these issues so that we can take action as appropriate to build on the ongoing work we already do with local authorities to unlock barriers to access. Finally, convener, I would like to put on record that without an army of volunteers, a lot of sport and physical activity would not take place. The dedication and time put in by so many to create opportunities and nurture new talent is the lifeblood of our sporting heritage and future. 
It's not only with sports clubs where volunteers are vital, the active schools programme is only possible with over 19,000 volunteers who deliver sport and physical activity in their communities. So, Convener, there is a lot of good work ongoing, but we are live to the challenges and welcome the committee's work in this so that we can collectively create the country that we all seek, one that is healthier and more active. And, of course, Convener, happy to take any questions that I know the committee will have on this. OK, thanks very much for that. Uh, Brian, would you like to kick us off? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning, uh, Mr. Grieve. I can just sort of, uh, start off with a sort of baseline here. A lot, a lot of this is around the, uh, uh, the Scottish Household Survey, and I'm interested to, in understanding whether within that Household Survey, included in that, were, were perhaps those who were on waiting lists uh, uh, to, to maybe join a sports club, uh, or maybe are inactive at the moment, but looking looking to be active and not yet active, um, or those who, in other words, is a, a capacity is there a capacity? issue that we need to address uh, and those who are uh, who would like to but uh, uh, you know they, but they can't actually access the, the the sports that they would they would want to do so you know the, the choice element so just as a sort of as a starter for 10 if you like a baseline of where the household survey and how deep the household survey went um so the household survey is the gold standard approach to assessing the activity levels of, of, of the country. Uh, but alongside that, as I said in opening remarks, we've also asked, uh, I've asked my, instructed my officials to work with our governing bodies to help them understand um, that full picture of activity and to help the governing bodies understand their own members uh, as well. So that's a bit of work that's ongoing to make sure that we uh, can help tell that full picture around um, the numbers of people who are members of a, of a sports club or the numbers who, like you say, might have joined for the first time, those who might have been inactive in the past who are now wanting to become a bit more active. So that's a bit, wor a bit of work that we're, work that we're doing with our governing bodies to help understand the points that I think you're making much more um, clearly. No, I th sorry. Yeah, uh, I, th I think. Th thank you. I, I, I think what I'm, I'm interested in is, is whether or not that, you know, that there are clubs that are at capacity. You know, um, and you know, and I, I know you know a lot of anecdotal evidence. My own kids included um, would like to join a club but can't at the moment because it's at capacity. And I'm just wondering whether or not you know those waiting lists are included within the household survey because that that would be that would be an important factor in terms of you know, wanting wanting to increase physical activity within the country. And I would, I would imagine that, that that would be evidence that would be re really useful to, to, to this particular survey. So I, again, you know, I think that work that we're doing with the governing bodies is really important because that gives us that fuller picture mm -hmm. as well. And we also understand that there has been spikes in interest in particular sports, particularly at points when there's been um, high profile events such as the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. And of course, this will be interlinked with the capacity issues that you've been looking at through volunteers and the volunteering opportunities to help deliver those opportunities. Um, that's why, you know, in our programme for government as well, for instance, we noted that we want to develop volunteering opportunities far more visibly and strategically as well, which will have an impact not just on sport, but a whole range of things that happen within a civic life in, in the country. Uh, Derek, do you want to... Uh, um, so uh, um, beyond the um, the household survey, the governing bodies of sport are far obviously much closer to the capacity issues of each club than than, than we are. And as part of the governing bodies plan for developing the sport, they have ongoing discussions with Sport Scotland, particularly around the um, supporting the increase of capacity of clubs, not least through volunteers, as the Minister mentioned, so increasing coaching, also facility access and, and the like. So the capacity issues are, are monitored very closely by governing bodies of sport and it's in forms of thinking on both local and regional development and part of the ongoing discussions between the club, between the governing body and Sport Scotland itself. Can I one more? Could be if I could. Um, I'd also be quite interested if, if you've looked at the sports that are uh, uh, perhaps increasing in, in, increasing their, their numbers, whether these are the easy access sports. And by that, I mean uh, the, the barriers to participation are not high. You know, the, 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 the cost to participation is not high. We know, you know, for example, if you want to go for a run, you need a pair of training shoes. If you want to go sailing, you need a boat. Uh, you know, so uh, have we looked have we looked at uh, comparing uh, sort of easy access sports to those that are not? Well, in my strategic guidance letter to Sports Scotland, we also have a, an emphasis on making sure that there is access, uh, accessible opportunity for uh, and to deliver on equalities uh, as well. Whether that analysis it has been explicitly done, um, 
I'm not sure. I'm sure that though there are probably a lot of there's a lot of work then to try and unpick and uh, unlock some of the barriers to those um, sports that you outlined. However, um, the community hubs provides that we have across the country provides opportunity to allow people to try sports that they might not ordinarily have done. So I know, for instance, in Mary Hill, um, sailing is one of those opportunities that's offered in, uh, I think it's the canals in, in, in Mary Hill as well. So there's sailing opportunities there. So there are really imaginative, innovative ways in which local, um, locally focused groups that deliver what might ordinarily be perceived as uh, pastimes for those with much more resource has been uh, created for people who might not have that same disposable income. So there has been opportunity provided there through community hubs, through innovative work and through using local assets. So in the case of Mary Hill, it's around the canal network that has been improved significantly over time. So there are young people there getting opportunity to sail and to experience um, sporting opportunities on the water there, uh, which might not ordinarily have been there for them had we not had a strategic approach through our community hubs and through the assistance we give to our government bodies and support through a variety of other things, for instance, cash back. No, I, I, I completely appreciate it. Mean, just, just for clarity, I was not suggesting that uh, you know we get we get a, 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 you know everybody in Glasgow into a, a, a Steve Red gave eight boat. I was what I was mm. what I was really looking for was to look at how you know how easy it is to access and should we focus on certain sports rather than others. That, that that's that's really where I was coming from. That I wasn't suggesting. So I think you know the other thing um, is that the. <laughs> You know, for young people in particular, so the active schools network is really important because that's given opportunities to sports, other sports. So it's not just, not just necessarily football, which might be the kind of um, the obvious go-to for reasons that it's a, a national game and there's so many people watch it, enjoy it, uh, and play it. But the active schools um, network provides opportunity to tasters and uh, the chance for young people to experience other sport and other activities. Uh, the reason I picked the Mary Hill example, I think, was just to kind of illustrate that that's not always the the easier things. It's not just about providing walking opportunities for young people who might not have the resource to enjoy sailing. There are things and examples out there that show that there is a wide variety of opportunity there, um, provided that there is the right conditions, the right um, connections across a community, the right uh, people leading those things that provide that really special opportunity and chance. And, you know, that's interlinked with our youth work approach as well. You know, the, the uniform groups, the, the youth, youth link, you know, are, articulate just what their youth work providers are giving in terms of opportunity to, to young people across across uh, the country and you know cashback also is providing that funding and that clear link around the proceeds of crime into providing positive pastimes for young people thank you panel one of the most stark figures in the, the 2016 um, Scottish Household study was this 18% gap between the most and least deprived communities when it comes to participation in sport and other physical activities. According to the survey, 87% of people from the most well-off background took part in some sort of physical or sporting activity, compared to 69% of people from the poorest background. What are the Scottish Government doing to close that activity gap? So that's, you know, and I mentioned that in my response to Brian Whittle, you know, we've been very clear in our direction to Sport Scotland that we want to see um, a focus on the communities that, that you've identified. And that's why the, the next iteration of community sports hubs will have a much keener focus on tackling areas of deprivation to ensure that there is opportunity and that we can nudge people in those areas towards being more active and becoming more active uh, as well. Because I don't think any of us want to see uh, we want to see those statistics improve. We want to see and ensure that there is opportunity for all to take part in sport because we know the transformative impact that sport can have on our communities and on people's lives and in their ongoing um, well-being throughout their, their, their life. So uh, absolutely, we want to um, reduce that um, inequality and make sure that we provide more opportunity for everyone regardless of their income. So, so, so will, will the government effectively be setting targets of organisations like Sports Scotland to increase participation specifically from the most deprived backgrounds? If you look at the, yeah, national, oh, sorry. the national outcomes at the moment, you, you talk about increasing physical activity and, and you mentioned the figures in your opening comment, but there was nothing specifically there about the gap between the most deprived and, and the most well-off areas. So at the moment, Sports Scotland are given funding to do what they do, but there is nothing linked to that funding when it comes to tackling issues within the most deprived areas. Like again, though, my strategic guidance letter though explicitly says that I want them to tackle um, inequalities and 
the community sports hubs, the next iteration of those, the next, I think, seven that they're taking forward will be in areas of deprivation to specifically and explicitly address the concern that you have, one that I would share, one that I want to tackle, one that I want to close. Just one, one, thing to point, one of the biggest barriers um, to people from the most deprived areas is the cost of participating in certain sports. Uh, and given the fact that a large number of the activities and sports centres are provided by local government, do you think that the, the reduction in funding for local government has had, a, a, along with the council tax freeze at the time, has had an impact on the cost of these activities? Well, you know, I think you know we probably would take. Uh, a different analysis around the local government settlement and that we believe we've given the local government a fair settlement to deliver the services that they are charged with delivering. Um, there is opportunity, as you know, ongoing at the next budget discussions around the different ways in which Scotland might use its powers to increase the mon money that we get into our, our coffers to, to, to deliver the public services that we hold dear. So there is opportunity for us all to take part in that discussion and that conversation that we're going to be having across the country. But certainly from our perspective, we've given local government a fair settlement. Of course, there are challenges. There are fiscal challenges for us in the, the Scottish government as well around our own budget suffering a, a reduction. So, um, you know, it is challenging, but what's why we want to make sure that we maximise the investment that we have already put into our sporting infrastructure, increasing the, the facilities that we have, the world-class facilities that we now have, the fact that we have, um, as a direct result of the Commonwealth Games, a legacy of community hubs across the country, that we have active schools and 32 local authorities that are giving people opportunity, young people opportunity to take part in sport. And those in particular, the active schools, I would cite that because that actually shows a greater uptake and a greater degree of participation in areas of deprivation which shows that that investment is uh, taken forward and led by Sports Scotland is delivering on the, um, on, the, on the issue that you raise and you correctly raise because we want to see more people get the opportunity to take part in sport and Active Schools is helping us to reduce that, that gap. The most recent SPICE um, briefing on local government showed that there was a 6.2% real terms for the local government revenue budget from 2010-11 to 2016-17. So the, the figures are there for everyone to see. And a consequence of that is right across Scotland, local authorities had to look at other areas for raising income. And clearly one of those areas was to increase charges for a whole host of services, including sport and activities. I'm just wondering whether the government has done any analysis on the impact of the budget settlement for local government and the rise in charges on participation levels, particularly from the most deprived communities? Well, again, you know, we believe that we've given local government a fair settlement. And, you know, if, if you're drawing those conclusions, again, you know, if that's part of the work that you've, on, you've uncovered yourself, if that's what you're seeing explicitly linked to, then, you know, by all means, it let us see that uh, analysis uh, as well. But what I am saying to you, that what we are doing is we're recognising that there is a requirement to make sure that people from deprived communities uh, get opportunity. That's why we have, in, our, in my strategic guidance letter to Sports Scotland, asked them to focus on uh, equality, asked them through the community sports hubs to tackle uh, and focus on areas of deprivation. And it's why the very clear commitment that Sports Scotland has to active schools is delivering uh, more keenly for those in deprived areas uh, as well, where the uptake is higher. The local government settlement is challenging. The local government settlement is utterly catastrophic. Uh, I, I've been talking to local authorities in the last couple of days, and they're showing me the documents that they've got assessing potential cuts to budgets. And these are documents piled this high. Youth work gone. Uh, community centres closed, libraries closed, swimming pools closed. It is utterly cast catastrophic and devastating for communities. In my view, it's the breakdown of society, which is what we're overseeing at the moment. Now, that will it absolutely is, and if you think that's not the case, then go and look at the, the potential cuts that local authorities are having to implement. They are utterly catastrophic, and it will be the most deprived and poorest communities that will suffer the most. So how... If, if you've not done the assessment of that, is that up to the committee to do the assessment of the impact of those cuts on, uh, on sport and participation? Is the government not doing any assessment of that? Well, 
You know, I think what I've said very clearly is that we recognise there are challenges there across making sure that those in areas of deprivation have access to opportunity, which is why I've charged our government, our, um, our sporting agency to tackle and look where, what more they can do to tackle inequality. And it's why you know, I specifically cited the active schools approach, which is delivering, currently delivering across 32 local authorities, opportunity for our young people, which has seen higher participation from those communities that are in uh, areas of deprivation. I, you know, again, though, you seem to me, forgive me, convener, making assumptions as well, and or perhaps you've done your own analysis, in which case that would be useful to see that. But of course, we recognise the challenges under which local authorities are working. That's why we continue to work with our local authority partners, which is why we work with um, our, our governing bodies, which is why we're intent on maximising the impact of the resources that have been put in to improve the infrastructure across the country. And that's why we want to continue that work, because we recognise there are challenges. We recognise that we need to do more to get more people active. But that's why we've particularly asked Sports Scotland to um, have a focus on areas of deprivation and ensuring that there's uh, equality of access for people. Sports Scotland spent almost £12 million on performance sport last year and £10.7 uh, million on clubs and communities. Is that the right balance in terms of encouraging more people uh, from the grassroots to get involved in sport? Well, Sports Scotland has uh, two roles. It has the role to ensure that support is given to our elite performers and also to be leaders in terms of activity and to develop a sport and infrastructure which allows for people to take part in sport. Also, it's not just Sport Scotland that delivers funding for sport. I and mean, actually, the balance is that there's 95% of resources that go into sport uh, is done on community level and 5% on elite. Yeah, but in terms of Sport Scotland's um, budget, is it the right balance that um, more is spent on performance sport than is on clubs and communities? Well, well I'm, I'm telling you, though, that 95% of the total money that's spent in sport is spent on community that's, Forgive infrastructure. me, but that's not what I asked. I asked uh -huh. In terms of Sports Scotland's budget, <coughs> is it the right balance that they spend £11.8 on performance sport and £10.7 on uh, clubs and communities? Is that the right balance? Um, again, I'll, I'll just gently reiterate that it's not just Sports Scotland that's in charge I, I of that. putting I, I know that. I know that. <laughs> forward opportunity of, for sport and 95% is spent on community based activity and sport and opportunities, 5% is spent on elite sport I'm, that I'm, balance to me feels about clear. right because I think if I was to cut elite sport that meant that we didn't see any elite performers doing well in some of the big events on a global stage I would also be held before this committee asking why we had not supported our athletes. I was particularly to asking about Sports Scotland's uh, funding. Uh, Marie. Convener. Um, yeah. It was just to clarify that if the Minister agrees that actually ensuring that we have elite performers um, achieving in international competitions is also exceptionally important, encouraging people to participate in sport. Absolutely. There is a number of different role models. There are community role models within our sports hubs, people taking forward fantastic work at that very local level, being role model models themselves and leaders within their own community. Likewise, though, the fact that we see Scottish athletes performing the world stage, doing well, provides a sense of great deal of pride, but also inspires the next generation to recognise that they can achieve it if they put in the hard work and endeavour. And what is also transformative is the fact that those, those athletes are going out and trying to ensure that they're part of that inspirational message. They're going out to schools, they're going out to communities, talking about their own resilience, those good lessons in life that our children and young people require so that they can go into emerge into adulthood and be successful uh, individuals themselves. So, yeah, absolutely, there is a real role model uh, element to our elite performers uh, as well, and they do that work and they are charged with that work and they deliver on that uh, responsibility that they have. Yeah, Marie. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the legacy uh, from the Commonwealth Games, which might be felt all around the country. We saw some evidence from Murray area, which um, stated that they weren't so sure that they had gained very much benefit from the Commonwealth Games. And yet next door in Highland, um, where I live, I know that people could reasonably easily identify some of the benefits that they had gained from the Commonwealth Games. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what the government did to ensure the legacy was felt countrywide and um, 
Yeah, no, abs absolutely. Um, and um, the community hubs has been one uh, legacy, a very tangible legacy that has been, you know, the, the, the expansion of community hubs across the country is, is, is a great success story, bringing people together at a community level to develop opportunities in many parts of the country. And of course, we have ambitions to increase the number of community hubs across the country. Um, moreover, there has been legacy in terms of the improved infrastructure across the country as well, which will be an ongoing and lasting legacy as well to allow people to have the, the chance to go and use uh, facilities in the country. There are also other things. So for instance, um, the Legacy 2014 Active Places Fund, that was a 10 million pound fund that was launched in 2012. And through five investment rounds, a total of 188 projects were supported across all 32 local authorities. So all local authorities have had some kind of benefit and a legacy felt within their area in an attempt to make sure that this wasn't just a Glasgow Games, that it was a countrywide Games and that there was legacy across the country. Uh, and so I think, you know, there is quite a strong story to tell around the legacy that has been left uh, post Commonwealth Games and continues to be felt across the country. Thank you. I, d I did hear a very lovely story from Ross Sutherland Rugby Club, who were very delighted with their um, rugby posts that they got from the Commonwealth Games, and they donated their rugby posts to further north in the country. So there certainly in Highland yeah. uh, was some mm. identifiable and tangible kit, even. Um, can I ask about um, active transport? I know it's not your portfolio, but certainly in terms of health, I, I was d absolutely delighted to see the doubling of funding to active transport in the programme for government. Um, it will be uh, uh, have a huge impact in the Highlands, uh, and I'm sure all over Scotland, but particularly in the Highlands, where um, we, we would see that as a you know cycling and things is a is a really important sport. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And i um, kind of keen to always make sure that not just in terms of my uh, sporting portfolio, but the public health element of my portfolio benefits from that um, investment as well. And that will that significant investment that's going to be put in between now and the end of the parliament into active travel is important. It's important to Hamza Yousaf's uh, uh, targets and uh, ambitions that he has within his transport uh, portfolio. But likewise, there is complete read across into my own portfolio as well. So there has been real success around recreational walking, but this will be helped and aided by the fact that we're going to be investing significantly into uh, an active travel infrastructure uh, and significantly investing in that as well. And it's all about, you know, that ability for people once they leave their house to have opportunity and choices that are easy for them to make. So that investment will be significant. There's a long way to go. You know, we've seen some great progress made already around people cycling to work and walking to work and feeling safe and doing that. Uh, but this will uh, go a long way to improving that infrastructure and allowing people to make those choices and having that choice to be made as opposed to default position and society and decisions being made around, around the needs of the car. Thank you. Claire? Thank you, convener, uh, and a thank you to the Minister for uh, joining us this morning. Um, as a committee, uh, during this inquiry, we um, were privileged to go along and, and visit some of the community sporting hubs, and I think it's fair to say that all of us were really impressed by the work that we saw there. Um, particularly, I was fortunate enough to visit the, uh, the Phoenix Centre in, in uh, Ivan McKee's constituency, and then we went to um, the community sports hub in Drum Chapel, um, but both um, from looking at the, at the papers, a lot of the funding that comes to a community sport hub comes from lottery, and certainly Sports Scotland were, have raised with the committee their concerns about reductions in lottery funding. And I was wondering if the minister is able to tell us if she's had any discussions with uh, the Westminster government about lottery funding, future sustainability of lottery funding, and any reassurances about how um, Sports Scotland can maintain the, the amount of money that they get from the lottery. And that is a concern around that uh, reduction in lottery revenues that, that I I would absolutely share and it's something that we have attempted to engage with the UK government with. I wrote to the UK government in the spring of this year and have yet to have a response back and that was around to examine the sustainability of the model to work out what more strategically can be done to increase revenues. Um, I think there has been there's a developing landscape of many different lotteries out there now which reduces the national lotteries impact. So it's a real pressing issue and um, we've yet, uh, yet, yet to hear back from the, the UK government despite attempts to try and uh, 
secure a meeting to discuss this, which I think would be in our best interest to to work on together. Absolutely. And what support would the Minister be looking for from this committee in terms of expediating a reply from the Westminster Government? I think particularly given the concerns that have been raised here, both from community organisations and from organisations like Sports Scotland. I mean, I, I, and I don't think this is... You know, this is a genuinely uh, made attempt to try and work out what can be done to try and stop the reduction, to try and work out what can strategically be done to uh, reverse that reduction in revenue. And that won't just benefit us here in Scotland, that would be a benefit that would be felt across across the board. So, And it's also not owned by any one political party. So if the committee are so minded to add a bit of weight to that call, then I would absolutely welcome and uh, encourage that because it's in all of our interests. We, regardless of party, we all share a desire to make sure that we see our community supported, that we see sport supported uh, as well. A lot of that historically has now been through national lottery. So when there is a reduction there, we need to try and work out what more we can do to try and and uh, stop that and alleviate that. So absolutely, if, if the committee is so minded, I would absolutely welcome that um, that support. Uh, Alison. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, I, I'm sure we all welcome the, the doubling of the active travel budget, but we have to bear in mind that it was just hovering over the 1% previously. And undoubtedly, that does make um, your own portfolio... It, it helps deliver an active Scotland, but... I'd like to look at that recreational walking. If we take recreational walking out of the official stats, participation has remained static at around 50%. And I'd like you know, the Minister's views on why we're not seeing that increased participation at the same levels in other forms of activity. I mean, if recreational walking has increased markedly, could it be because that is probably one of the least expensive things you can get involved in? I guess I would also question why you would want to take out walking out of that because if we're going to, and as our Active Scotland framework, uh, outcomes framework also indicates, um, it's about activity. So activity being walking, why would you take that out of the equation? Because, and also it's not just by accident that there has been an increase in recreational walking. There has been a, a strategic approach to try and in increase the number of people who take, uh, who take part in recreational walking through our investment in Paths for All, through our, our strategic approach to, to walking. So it's not just by accident that this has, um, has that we've seen increases. There has been a, a deliberate approach and attempt to increase the numbers. But I certainly would find it confusing that you would want to take out walking into what would be a, an important part of the activity story. Um, I absolutely would not want to take out walking. I'm just wondering what lessons can be learned about the success um, that's been achieved in the increased walking. I'm just wondering, too, if the increase in walking has come at the cost of, you know, decreased participation in other areas. No, I think probably walking is one, like you say, walking is an easy thing. And it's about making sure that we can let people know that walking is something that they can take reasonably cheaply. They don't need fancy goods. They don't need fancy footwear or sports gear. And, you know, making sure that the infrastructure is there and right around about people to support that choice is important, which is why, again, you know, the active travel budget going up is important as well, because it just allows people to have that choice on their doorstep when they leave their house that they can take and make that, that choice. Is there more to do? Of course there is more to do. Is there lessons to be learned? Pro you, probably there are lots of lessons to be learned. Uh, and I think probably around that very steely you know, strategic focus that we had on walking to ensure that more people recognise the pleasure that they can get from uh, the outdoors through walking. Um, you know, I think, though, um, I would be disinclined to remove walking, though, from that activity story, because actually that's something that has shown growth. It's a positive story, and it shows that people are becoming more active. It might not necessarily be through the competitive sports. However, uh, it's active nonetheless, and that's what we judge ourselves on our success in our Active Scotland Outcomes Framework. I'd just like to put on the record, absolutely, that I don't think walking should be excluded. <laughs> I was simply asking that when that recreational walking is excluded, participation has remained static at around 50%. Um, I, I should probably draw um, uh, my members' My register of interest points out that I'm a board member of Scottish Athletics. And the next question I'd like to ask is around the 
the Jog Scotland funding, which was removed and then subsequently some of it was replaced and there will now be a partnership with another agency, Sam H. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that, that myself and all members of the committee were fairly astonished when the, the funding was withdrawn in the first place because that is a programme that has had proven success breaking down socio-economic barriers, getting women who've previously been uninvolved in physical activity involved. And I suppose a bit like recreational walking, it's one of these things you can do from your front door, doesn't take a lot of equipment. Um, uh, you know, I think it's a real success story. So I just wondered if the Minister could give us an update on that funding. Um, yeah, we, you know, there, there, was, there, there was support there and funding for, for Jog Scotland that was designed to try and improve its sustainability. And there was also work done by uh, Scottish Government officials also to evidence that uh, as well. So there is now that clear story to tell, which is why the, I think the collaboration between uh, with Sam H is so important because that's then also been very explicit around the the, the good uh, health benefits that come from uh, from from jogging and um, so there has been uh, you know in amongst the, the additional two million pounds that I announced earlier this year uh, to offset the reduction in national lottery that's helped to uh, ensure that the, the the funding is there for Jog Scotland. Thank you. Um, thank you, convener. Okay, so just. Why was it reduced in the first place? What was the reason? There was uh, there was always support and funding for for Jog for Jog Scotland, but what was required was a work was work to be put into ensuring the sustainability of Jog Scotland, and that's why there was work that was carried out through government officials to evidence the impact of that, and that has now paid dividends because we can now, as as Alison Johnson uh, articulated, see the very clear an evidence link between the um, health improvements that are felt through jogging and the work that Jog Scotland is doing at a community level right across the country. And it is one, uh, an approach through Scottish athletics that I think we should, yeah, we absolutely welcome. That's exactly the territory that we want our governing bodies to, to be in. Is it because there was no evidence at that time? No, it was around making sure that there was, there was work asked there was work requested to ensure the sustainability of the model, which was why there was um, payment given from uh, Sports Scotland to, to enable and develop that sustainability, work through uh, the Scottish Government to ensure that there was evidenced approach. And that's now you know, showing that it is a sustainable model, that there is um, evidence there, and they've got this partnership with Sam H, which I think is something that is uh, to be welcomed. I'm sorry, I'm not... I'm, I'm not I'm not really clear on that. Maybe I'm just not understanding how it worked, because my understanding is the, the, the funding was taken away, then there was representations made by various people in the committee and others, and then the funding was put back in via Sam H. Is that how it worked? The, there was a request to, to develop the sustainability of the model. So there had been um, a one-off supplementary investment to Scottish Athletics by Sports Scotland to support the transition of Jog Scotland into something that was more sustainable. There was also work ongoing with uh, the Scottish Government to develop the evidence base around the impact of Jog Scotland. And uh, you know, now we have the development of the partnership between Jog Scotland and Sam H, which I think is something that is that is very positive and again just illustrates that that link of a uh, activity improving health outcomes Ivan Thanks. Um, I, I want to talk a wee bit about the overall measures but before I got on to that I just wanted to uh, comment on the interaction earlier on about the um, the funding and the balance between um, elite and um, participation um, as the convener pointed out there was they picked two lines from the um, Sports Scotland budget, but there's only two lines out of seven and only represent a small part of the total spend. Uh, now, some of the lines are a bit confusing, but if you actually look at the total spend, 77.5 million of that, about 15%, or the 11.9 million I mentioned was on performance sport. You only picked one of the other lines and there was five other lines there that, based on what you've said, only 5% of the total spend is elite. I'm assuming the vast majority of the other lines being that place is at nearly 20 million. Um, partnerships at 4 million, schools and education at 13 million, etc., etc. The vast bulk of those will also be, I'm assuming, 
um, at a participation level rather than an elite level. And as you also correctly said, if you look at the whole big picture, there's about 495 million spent in sport in total. So when you actually look at it on that basis, that 11.9 million that was referred to earlier is about 2.4%. Does that kind of tie in with how you see the numbers? Well, I, you know, the Sport Scotland is one part of the funding picture for sport and activity. There is local authorities and a whole host of other organisations as well, and it's that global total that I would uh, say that 95% is uh, focused on participation community groups, uh, and also uh, then the 5% is focused on elite performance. And I think that that balance feels right, um, and you know, Sports Scotland take their responsibility very seriously around how they are leaders in not just uh, elite performance, but they also want to be leaders in, in ensuring that our population can become more active, which is why the active schools investment is also really important, particularly when we know that the biggest take-up has been in areas of deprivation around the active schools, which shows how important it is to provide opportunity in that school-based setting free of charge uh, to young people. That, that's fine, thanks. It's important to get that on the record because a selective quoting of specific statistics out of the whole big picture doesn't really help us develop our understanding. Um, talking about measures, um, we've obviously got the national outcomes and national performance indices, um, indicators, um, which from memory has kind of been flat at about 60, low 60%. Kind of number, but we've also been talking about the the Scottish Household Survey, which has got two numbers in there, with walking, which is going from 72 up to 79, um, and the without walking, which I agree with you, it's kind of it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about it without walking, but that's been been at 50 percent. Um, can you cast any light on the difference between those numbers? What's uh, the national performance indicator and what's in the household survey, and what kind of why they're different, um, and which you think is the most accurate reflection of what we're trying to achieve? So, um, aside from that, the National Performance Framework, our Active Scotland Outcomes Framework takes on board the Household Surveys, the Health Surveys, Grown Up in Scotland Surveys, a whole host of other things as well, uh, in an attempt to then use that as a way to demonstrate improvement, stability or if it is uh, going the other way, which we would want to reverse. De so the Active Scotland Outcome Framework takes on board a whole host of different um, ways in which we collect data and evidence of activity uh, across the country um, and on uh, different ages and stages of, of, of life. Um, Derek, do you want to add anything more around the... That. Um, so I, I just say there's no there's no direct comparison between the two the household survey and the, the, the health survey they are the data is cut and sliced slightly differently so health survey is, is uh, aggregated at health board level rather than the household survey aggregated at, at local authority level so it gives a different way to, to cut much of the same data although one does exclude children and one's just adults right. no, just because one of them's obviously gone up significantly and the other one's kind of been flat so I don't know if they're measuring different things or, or obviously they are so, which one should we focus on? Well, well we focus that's on why we use an active Scotland outcome framework is bringing together all of that, plus growing up in Scotland, which is that longitudinal right. um, um, analysis of children's life and experiences in Scotland. Um, so, all of that's brought together for our active Scotland, out, active Scotland outcome framework um, uh, as well. I guess the large kind of general thrust is that there is still a lot to do to try mm -hmm. and get our uh, population a bit more active and nudge them in that right in that right direction. Uh, there is encouraging signs around walking. Um, mm -hmm. There are encouraging signs around the activity levels of of our uh, children and young people, as I said in my outline uh, 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 earlier on. So, um, so regardless of the the way in which we collect the statistics and whatever way they're cut up, I think what we have to take from that is that there is improvement, marginal improvement in areas, but a lot, a lot still to do to bring people from being inactive to active. Uh, and the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework is an attempt to bring together all those um, different ways of collecting data to then corral that into a sense that we can understand whether our activity in terms of policy and legislation and whatever is delivering on uh, what we seek to achieve. Yeah, I mean, since we're trying to deliver something, it's always good to have a measure, and we've got several measures that, that are all yeah. going in different directions. It's kind of difficult to know if we are making progress or not. So, so I don't know so if so I certainly would, you know, you probably have yeah. I mean, looked at the Active Scotland Outcome Framework uh, as well, which um, 
actually is lauded internationally as an as an approach. Other countries are looking at that as an approach to to adopt. You know, so you know while we have the right things in place to measure success, the kind of the real uh, challenge is actually making sure that it's implemented effectively to ensure the improvements that we need to see. Okay, thanks. Sorry, sorry. Just that, the, the, that has got an outcome from McRoe really clear on how we measure success, and that's the number of people who are active, both children and adults. That's a top line measure. There are a whole range of indicators that inform that against each of the six outcomes, but the, the, the measure of success is really clear, and that's the number of people who are meeting the physical activity, activity guidelines, both adult and children, and that's drawn from the, the health survey. And so that's the one that's in the performance, the, the national performance indicator? No. The National Performance Framework is something slightly different yeah. to Scotland Outcome Framework. There is a physical activity um, indicator, but again, that's drawn from the, physical, the Scottish Health Survey. So it's drawn from the same data, but the National Performance Framework is slightly different to the Act of Scotland Outcome Framework, but the Act of Scotland Outcome Framework is linked to the National Performance Framework. Right. But so the, Act of framework, the Act of Scotland Outcome Framework is the one that we're working to. Right, I suppose I would be a bit concerned that we've got national performance indicators, but what you're actually measuring yourself against is but disconnected yeah. from that. So the national performance framework is getting revised as well, so it's important right. that we then use so that as an opportunity to align these okay. as explicitly as we can. But that certainly from, from my perspective, warts and all, it's the uh, Active Scotland Outcome Framework. And okay. that's the thing as well, that when we have our national st strategic group, which brings together Sports Scotland, Education Scotland, Transport Scotland, SNH, all the rest of it, that's the thing that we're agreed to, signed up to, to deliver on. Right. And that's the one that's going from 72% to 79%, which is good. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. Thank Jenny. you. Jenny. <laughs> no, right. Good morning to the Minister. Um, I have quite a specific question with regard to early experiences in life and sport activity. We know that the earlier you can intervene in terms of getting kids to uh, take up a sport, the more likely they are to participate in sport later in life. And the committee has previously taken evidence from Aberdeen University and Andrea Cameron, who told us that children who have had a poor experience in school are less likely to stick with sport and exercise as they go into adulthood. And that poor experience could perhaps be linked to their experiences of PE in schools. Um, I wonder, do the Scottish Government currently quality assure what type of sports are delivered in our schools? So, for example, by carrying out a survey, do we have an idea nationally of what type of sport is being delivered in our schools? And I know that's really a specific point. In terms of working out whether this is providing a good experience for young people? Or I suppose my question is, and this would be my supplementary, um, in my experience as a, as a teacher previously, what sports were delivered in school were very much dependent upon the teacher's specialisms. Okay, right. So there might be an inequality there in opportunity. Um, what I would point to, though, as well, is that the fastest growing areas of, for girls' participation, at the, which we announced at the start of Active Women and Girls in Sport Week, was around karate, dodgeball, uh, cross-country... Oh, I can't. Sorry, forgive, forgive me, but karate. But so certainly what I'm trying to point out is that it's maybe not the natural kind of things that you would associate with um, PE tuition in schools. So that has shown that when there is opportunity provided through active schools, that when young girls in particular got the opportunity, that that's where we saw the, f the quickest and fastest growth. Rugby was the other one. Sorry, I'm seeing Marie Todd there. Sorry. And of course, uh, rugby was was the, was the other one. Um, heaven for me for forgetting that. Um, but um, so that, I think maybe shows that there is a kind of a, an attempt to try and, and shift away from that. The other thing I would point to is where our governing bodies are doing some really interesting and innovative work. So uh, Netball Scotland, through their Silence for Success programme, which I went to see in Shawlands uh, Academy, are using that role model uh, of their professional sporting stars to kind of unpick some of the barriers that particularly adolescent girls are facing and feeling in schools. And again, I would highlight Shawlands Academy for some fantastic work that they're doing around ensuring equality of access to sport, particularly for LGBTI uh, uh, groups in our country. They have developed with Leap Sport uh, a framework to ensure that people recognise the barriers that uh, young people will face when they're about to do sport and how that can be off-putting and how that can be off-putting not just for them at school but off-putting uh, for life. So that is something that I would certainly uh, encourage the uh, committee to look at because that has been young, led by young people themselves through Leap Scotland and is potentially a tool for other schools to use and you know as we hurtle towards the end of the year we're also coming into that time where social dancing happens and you know sometimes that has memories that might be positive but they might not be and um, particularly if you're a young trans uh, 
person in school, getting told girls line up one side, boys line up the other, that can be a barrier. That's really that's really difficult. And um, so I would, I would certainly cite the work that Shawlands Academy have done. Leap Scotland have, have supported that. But um, but there's probably more that we can do to make sure that we have a focus on what opportunities are provided to young people at schools. Some of that will be led by the particular teacher's own experience and knowledge and their own sport and background. Uh, but likewise, I think we should take heart from the fact that through active schools, a, a range of experiences are, and opportunities are being provided. And that's why we're seeing growth in karate, rugby, dodgeball, where they're taking that opportunity up and participating in those sports. Thank the Minister for that. Um, my sister teaches in Shawlands Academy, so I'll certainly be speaking to her about, about <laughs> all the good work that they're doing. They also um, stirred up some trauma from years gone by, and some of us, but not as much of the trauma as the people who had to dance with us, I'm sure. Um, oh, but I, I'd love to have a dance with you. Uh, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you, you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> a broken foot might, uh, uh, Brian. <laughs> it's a, it's a couple of That'll make the diary at the weekend. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I, sorry, I've got, I've got a vision in my head. I've got a vision in my head of uh, dancing with him. Um, the, uh, if I could, just, just a couple of quick points in the, the, the difference between and the measurement there you're talking about between walking and then separating, separating that out, the, the uh, uptake on, on sport, the reason that I think that's important, I absolutely agree with Alison Johnson that uh, uh, any kind of activity um, is, is uh, very, very welcome. But the reason I think it has to be um, uh, separated is in terms of sport needs a lot more framework. Uh, to participate and needs more volunteers to participate than it would be uh, in some of you know uh, easy access activities uh, like walking, and one of the reasons we have to measure that is is our understanding as we like at the start is around capacity whether that's a barrier uh, or whether we've reached a saturation point or we have access to it. So that that that's, that would be my point there of why it is important that we measure those two. Uh, or our ability to to see those two separately. But to go, to go back to the convener's point around Jog Scotland, I think. It's obvious, Minister, that, that um, the, the funding was withdrawn and was put back in place mainly because of, you know, uh, pressure from from this Parliament and this committee. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. That's you know, when, when perhaps mistakes are made, that, that their, their ability to be rectified. With with that in mind, um, do not do you not consider swimming at school uh, as a sort of compulsory? Uh, swimming at schools, certainly in primary schools, is something we could we could look at again, given that sort of forty percent of children are now going to secondary school unable to swim, and if they're unable to swim, they're then not able to to participate. And this is uh, again to, to uh, Colin Smith's point, more prevalent in the sort of lower percentile uh, sort of the poorer communities. Is it not perhaps something that the, the Scottish government should be looking at around reintroducing? funding for to ensure that all primary schools get access to, to swimming? So um, the curriculum is not um, dictated um, and what we're wanting to see is more young people get opportunity of access to be physically active and swim will be play a part of that um, and alongside that we do um, support um, uh, the governing body Swim in Scotland with, with uh, investment and will continue to support increasing activity levels and um, highlighting the importance of that. And swimming will continue to always be an important part of the P curriculum in many schools. But it's something that has been a, a long-standing tradition in Scotland that is not a, a national curriculum. And we don't specify explicitly what, what things should be part of that, apart from, um, I think, um, religious and moral education. But um, we continue to support swim in Scotland to deliver opportunities for young people. I mean, there's 1.7 million pounds withdrawn, and, and I would suggest to you that swimming is not just about activity; it's a life skill uh, that allows uh, allows going through you know, kids going through life uh, to participate in all sorts of ways. Even if that's going on holiday and jumping in the swimming pool. Um, and all I'm asking you, Minister, is that that, uh, that, that uh, you reintroduce, or perhaps there's the opportunity to reintroduce that kind of um, funding to allow schools again to, to uh, uh, ensure that all primary school kids have access to swimming? Um, again, you know, I think we don't deny the importance of swimming, not just as a, an opportunity to be physically active, but of course the life skills that brings. But then all, all sports provide life skills around resilience, around confidence, and all the whole host of, of um, positives that sport brings to a young person's life. 
Um, swimming will be an important part of the PE offer in many schools. In fact, it's been delivered across many schools uh, in Scotland. And again, you know, we continue to invest in uh, Swimming Scotland to, to support the work that they do to provide opportunity. But, you know, if the committee is so minded that they want to place that as a recommendation, well, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look at that and also continue to work in dialogue with, with uh, politicians, uh, particularly at the point in which, you know, we, we can... Uh, budgetary discussions or whatever you know you know that's that's up, up to you if that's something you want to push but certainly we recognize and support a uh, swimming and we recognize the importance of swimming brings to young people's lives and that's why it's currently delivered in in in, in schools across the country okay. point just in relation to volunteering because we haven't covered that um we found that uh, uh, many of the um the clubs and organisations very much rely on a key person, could be a coach or, or a key volunteer within the, those organisations, and that mm. um, it can be pretty precarious if that volunteer becomes ill or um, or, or moves on or retires or whatever. Um, what, what's been done to encourage m many more volunteers into um, uh, into sport and activity and coaching? Um, so. You know, I think a lot of work happens at a local level. A lot of work goes on uh, through our support and governing bodies to support volunteers and support volunteering opportunities. Sport Scotland offers uh, support uh, as well. And, of course, within our programme for government, we have an explicit commitment to uh, being more strategic in how we support volunteering, not just... <laughs> Um, for sport, but across the board, you know, we've got some fantastic um, examples of volunteering across the country out with sport, children's panel, whole host of things, um, and um, we'll also use the opportunity of next year's Year of Young People to ensure that young people understand the benefits that they can get from from volunteering uh, as well. And also, I think I said in my opening remarks around the nineteen thousand uh, volunteers that have been um, pivotal to the delivery of the Active Schools programme. Okay, thanks very much, Minister. Thanks for your time okay, this morning. And uh, as agreed previously, we'll move into private session. Thank you.